if you recall from our study, in the book of Philippians, which was one of the prison epistles, you know, we have Philippians and Ephesians, Colossians and Philemon, written by Paul in prison, what's called Paul's first Roman imprisonment. He had two, but this is the first. Okay, this is a, a good imprisonment. And the second one is not going to be, it's only in the fact that all things work together for good to those who love God. So we'll talk about that. We have been in Philippians 1, 12 through 14, where Paul talks about the greater per, uh, uh, progress of the gospel, even though he's in prison, first Roman imprisonment, the gospel is spreading like wildfire from the prison. And uh, it's taken on, as it always does, a life of its own. Uh, once the gospel is presented, well, uh, write this down. Write this down. John 16. John 16, 7 through 11 tells you that when you present the gospel or the word of God, it takes a life on its own. Because the Holy Spirit begins to bring conviction in the hearts of people. The word of God brings conviction in the hearts of people. The gospel, of course, brings it towards the death, burial, and resurrection of, gospel, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Otherwise, the word of God has the, the authority in your life by the directive will of God. If you become disobedient to the directive will of God, then God deals with the permissive will and then he overrules it. And so there's three classifications of the will of God that you need to really understand as Christians so that when it comes to your life, you understand what God is doing. So I want you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Acts, which is a strategic, important directive will of God given from God to the Apostle Paul in regard to his ministry. In regard to his ministry. This has nothing to do with his personal life. It has to do with his ministry life. In other words, it's not how Paul is reacting in his personal affairs of his own life, but how he's dealing with the plan of God. So in Acts, the 16th chapter, they're at Troas in verse 9. In Asia Minor, they've, they're on the second missionary trip, and they're at Troas of Asia Minor. And Paul has stopped the, the evangelism to determine now, having evangelized Asia Minor, should he go north up into the Black Sea area and into Russia? Should he go uh, south, go back, or go east, or go west? What direction should he go? And God go, told him to go west in verses 9 and 10. A vision appeared to Paul in night, a man of Macedonia, which is west, that's Paul is going to cross the Aegean Sea and go to the European theater, which we call Greece. They called it Macedonia and Archaea. He saw a vision, a, 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 a vision appeared to Paul in the evening, the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to Paul, saying, Paul, come over to Macedonia and help us. So when he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. He was, he was searching for a direction. Should I go north, south, east, or west? God told him to go west. Your ministry, now listen to why God told him that. If you study the life of Paul, you will see that Paul was called to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Peter was called to be an apostle to the Jew. And Paul made it very clear to God made it very clear to Paul that he wanted Paul to preach to the Gentiles, not to the Jews. That he had left that assignment to Peter. And this assignment to Paul is go to Gentiles. And now he's told him where he wants to go. He wants him to go west. He wants him to go into the European theater which began with Greece and goes all the way to Spain and, uh, and the rest of it, you know, geographically. 
That was a clear assignment on the, as clear as a bell, as they say, a clear assignment to Paul on the second missionary trip. It's called, they call this in theology study, they call it the call to Macedonia or the Macedonian call. It is really important to our lesson and to the life of Paul because Paul is going to do four missionary trips. And on the second trip, God made it clear he wanted him to go west into the European theater. And he, he made it clear to Paul that the next assignment was Rome and from Rome to Spain. Now, if you're a student of the Bible, and I mean you just read it, if you read it and study it, you'll know what I'm saying because it's very clear in the life of Paul. This is very clear. So Paul has a very clear revelation of the direction his ministry is to go from Asia Minor. He is to go west, cross the Aegean Sea into the Europe theater. Uh, he, the first convert to Europe is going to be called Lydia. All theologians tell you that. Anybody worth their salt in study of the Bible tell you the first convert of Europe was Lydia. The first church of Europe was a Philippi. Well, anyhow, I'm just telling you, uh, we're, let's, let's have a word of prayer. Let's have a word of prayer. Uh, anytime I put scriptures on your paper, I may not read them, but who should? You. <laughs> I'll write those scriptures down there. I can't get to everything, but I want you to get to everything. Everything I tell you, I document. So I may not get, I've read Acts 16. Uh, I did 9 through 10. But notice all the way to Spain is Romans 15, 28. So I give you scripture to tell you where we're going. Okay? And we're going to take a look at the life of Paul because when he gets through with Macedonia and Archaea, which is Greece, and he's supposed to now go to Rome and then on to Spain. He doesn't. And the third missionary trip begins with him not obeying which direction to go. And I'm going to tell you, things do not go well for it, for him. It doesn't go well for him. So we're going to study that today because, listen, if you think you're bigger than the will of God, you're not. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're the Pope. You're not bigger than the will of God. And, and, and God is going to have to show this to Paul. You do what I tell you. I don't do what you tell me. You got to figure out who's in charge of your life. You got to figure out who's in charge of your life. If you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day, that's called the gospel. If you believe it, you're saved. Once you're saved, you belong to God. And, and that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. And he tells you how he wants you to live. He tells you what he wants you to do. And that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. That's not a bad thing. Well, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into this study. And so, our Father, we thank you today for these that have come with us. We understand the principle, Father, we can't study the Bible in the flesh. In the Christian life, evidence of the flesh is carnality, and the evidence of carnality is personal sin. That we've been living in the flesh. We haven't been living in the Spirit. We haven't been living according to the Word. We've been living according to the world. So how do we get out of this mess? Well, the first thing we do is we confess our sin. It takes us back to the cross where it all began in our life. We come, we come back to the cross, this time not for salvation, but for sanctification, for the ministry of the indwelling third member of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit in my life. And we never get too big for our britches that this is not always true. It doesn't matter what category you're in in spiritual growth or ministry, this thing always holds true. We need to understand that. And so I pray today, Father, for 1 John 1, 9 to be effective in our life as we study the Bible, 
We can't study the Bible in the flesh and get divine revelation. We have to study it in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we confess our sins today, whether mental attitude sins or sins of the tongue or overt sins, we confess them in silence and privacy to you because we need the power of the thinking of the third member of the Godhead in our life to stay on track for the plan of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last Sunday, I introduced you uh, to three classifications of the will of God. You really need to understand this. If you're new to Bible study, you haven't understood this, you need to. Excuse me. Three classifications. There's the directive will of God. There is the permissive will of God. And there is the overruling will of God. You need to come to understand this. We're going to study these three ideas through the life of Paul from the third missionary trip. And, uh, most of that comes from the book of Acts. Now I'm going to tell you four things this morning about this. The directive will of God. What you, they, people say, well, Ron, what is the directive will of God? The directive will of God is a specific doctrine that has been taught to you or revealed to you. A specific information revealed to a spiritually advancing believer. That's one in Bible study, hopefully to grow from it. For Paul, it was to go westward. The directive will of God on his second missionary trip when he stopped at Troas and he asked the Lord, what direction should I go? You can study out of the book of Acts 16. And the Lord said, go west, go to Macedonia. When he got to Macedonia and Archaea, Greece, and he was successful in evangelizing that country, God told him to go to Rome and Spain. And Paul knew it. I'll show you the evidence of that today. And he didn't do it. And when, when you... When you are, when the word of God reveals to you exactly what God wants you to do and you don't do it, you, you're, you're in for a tough walk. I can tell you that. Because God, listen, God wants you to, listen, he wants, to, he wants you to walk with him. He doesn't want you to walk with the world. You don't have to walk with the world. He wants you to walk with him. That's why he gave the Holy Spirit and said, I want you to walk by his power. In Galatians 5, 16, he says, I, and he commands you, I want you to walk. I gave you the Holy Spirit, third member of the Godhead, who lives inside your body from the point of salvation till you die and be with the Lord. And I gave it so that he could walk you with God. Under the ministry of the Holy Spirit, you can walk with God, you can talk with God. You can pray with God. There are a lot of things you can do with God, not just to him. Because of the third member of the Godhead who dwells in your life. And so for Paul, it was on his second missionary trip. Uh, he stopped in Troas, having successfully evangelized, in his opinion, uh, Asia Minor. He wanted to know which way to go, and God told him to go west, go to Macedonia, do Greece, then I'm going to send you to Italy, do Rome, uh, Italy, on to Spain, and into the Europe theater. Listen. I have people in my congregation today from the University of Troy and from the University of Alabama where I was a Bible teacher to college kids who upon graduation came to Birmingham. They could have went anywhere with degrees that they wanted to go. They could have been in state someplace. They could have been out of state someplace. These were sharp people. They chose to go to Birmingham, Alabama so that they could set under Bible teaching, under my Bible teaching, because that's where I was based. I was based in Birmingham. The directive will of God 
always is connected to a geographical will, a mental will, and an operational will. And some of these people are still sitting with me and have retired from their, minute, from their degree, their scholarly degree. They now live in retirement and they're still with me. Because they knew in their heart that the directive will of God for their life was to set unto somebody that could take them into spiritual growth maturity. And it involved a geographical place, a mental attitude, and an operational function. They're still here. After 47 years of teaching, I said to this group, I've got to go to Moody. I have got to go to Moody. I've got to go to Moody. I have a calling from God to go to Moody. And everybody went like, Moody? You're going to Moody? I went, I know. I know. Not Vestavia, not Hoover, not Mountain Brook. <laughs> Places that they would have been more acceptable to. Moody and St. Clair County. I have had no clear from clearer understanding from God than I did to go to Moody. And so here I am. <laughs> I'm a Moody. I'm in Moody because God sent me here. There is no doubt in my bones. There's none. You know what's a wonderful thing? Not everybody in the other church came with me. Moody? I'm like, yeah. But you know what? The group that I was with in Troy University and the University of Alabama, do you know what? They came with me. And I am so forever thankful to you. You have no idea the confidence that gave me that I was making a right choice, and even though I might lose other people, I had to go. And this group came with me, and I am so thankful to you. It was, I was so thankful when I saw you show up in Birmingham, Alabama, and you could have went anywhere. And I am so thankful that you came out here with me because you could go anywhere. We're not the only church out there. We're the best. <laughs> we're, we're, but we're not the only one. So I'm in Moody. I'm in Moody because of the directive will of God. I had a clarity of a revelation in my heart as much to go to Moody as Paul was to go to Macedonia. I can tell you that for sure. I was going to Moody. One way or the other, I, was, I had to go to Moody. And so here I am. The directive will will always have three important categories connected to it. It'll always be a geographical will. Where's the geographics? For Paul, it was what? Europe. Go to the European theater. Go westward, Paul. Go, go, go to... Go to Macedonia, then go to Archaea, do Greece, then go to Rome, do Italy, go to Spain, and then do all of Europe, or until I tell you stop. And so you, there is always a geographical will. For Paul, it was to evangelize Macedonia, Archaea, go to Rome, and to Spain. That is clear in the Bible. It's called a European theater. The mental will for Paul, there's always a mental will. The mental will for Paul was to go into one direction. That's simple, isn't it? I mean, it was like me. I went, well, Father, where, where would I go? I had invitations to go other places when people knew I was going. I had other invitations. You know, I know that's hard for you to believe. But I had other invitations. 
In fact, I had other invitations out in Moody. But when I, when I went into the area and discovered it wasn't called Moody. It was called by another name. For example, on one side, it was called Leeds, and on the other side, it was called Odenville. And I went, what? Where's Moody? <laughs> and they said, well, it's in between those two places. And I went, well, who knew? And so I, I, I was, I listened, I could have went to Leeds. I had an offer at Leeds, and I had an offer in Odenville. But I knew God wanted me in Moody. And then I find out it's, it's stuck in between these two places. And somebody could have said, well, listen, you could have reached in there from either side. Not if you spend any time with either side. No, Leeds ain't going to come over here. Odenville, that's going to drive down this. It's too far. I don't know. Maybe not. I'm just telling you what I've learned. So, the geographical will. There's always a, there is always a geographical will, there's always a mental will, and there's always an operation will. What does God want Paul to do when he goes to Macedonia? He wants him to preach the gospel. He wants, to, he wants to, him to confirm the converts with, with milk doctrines. He wants, to, he wants him to establish churches. He wants him to train ministers. That's a... And Paul did it everywhere he went. So Paul had a mental will, an operational will. It was to present a clear gospel to teach doctrines of salvation, like on your paper, Hebrews 5, 11 through 14. Establish churches, uh, train ministers and ordain them. Epaphroditus is one that passed through the church at Philippi. So you have a directive will of God, you have a permissive will of God, you have an overruling will of God. I'll show them all to you today. The directive will always has three categories that have to line up. They must always line up. The geographical, mental, and operational. All right? So Paul has this call to go to Macedonia. It's a directive will. It has to involve geographics, it did. It has to, mental, it did, and operational. Point number two. The spiritually advancing believer is being transformed. The spiritually advancing believer, that's one who is interested in the study of the Bible to walk by faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. And then you're required to walk by faith. First, you're required to cycle it, to hear it, believe it, and apply it. Then you get into the walking aspect of it, of 2 Corinthians 5, 8, 7, and 8. The spiritually advanced believers are being transformed by cycling the Word of God. Now, write this on your paper under point two. Guy didn't put it. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. The Bible says that all Scripture is God-inspired or, or, or God-breathed. God-inspired or God-breathed means inhale, exhale. You take the Bible in and learn it, and then you apply it to your life. Inhale, exhale. Inhale, exhale is the cycling business. All right? So you need to know that. We are being transformed by the cycling of the Word of God. In Romans, the 12th chapter, verse 2, I put it on your paper. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is. See, the Word takes you to the will of God, and the word, will of God takes you to the work of God. See the three W's? The word takes you to the will. The will takes you to the work. And when you get involved in that, you get involved in what Paul called transformational living. Your life is being transformed by the exercise of learning and applying the word of God to your life. It's called transformation. Real change going on in the way you think and behave 
and even what, how you view your future. This is really important. Now, he's told, he told you a negative and a positive. Watch the negative. The negative is do not be conformed to the world. See, it's either the world or the word. You're living by one of two things. You're either living by the world standard or by the word standard, by the word of God, either by the world or by the word. If you're living by the world, you're, you're conforming your life to the ways of the world which are in opposition to the will of God. So that when the will of God comes along, you blow it off. You blow it off. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may prove what the will of God is. Watch. Do you see the three things? Listen, underneath them write one, two, three. One, the will of God, when it begins to be exercised, bringing transformation. What brings transformation to your life? When you convert the word of God into the will of God in your life. When you take the word of God and take it into the will of God, it transforms your life. It transforms your life to the standard of God and not to the standard of the world. That's how you know you're in transformation. That's how you know your life is always leaning towards what the will of God is in my life and not against what the world wants, always what God wants. You're always leaning in that direction as if you're being pulled in that direction. That's how you know this stuff, people. Notice that the will of God when it's being exercised is what? Number one is good, right? Number two, acceptable. And number three, Perfect or complete. What does that work in your life? What's that work in your life? What well, are you missing it? The will of God. Look at, look at, look at. You're being transferred by the renewal of your eyes. You ought to circle the will of God on your paper so you don't miss it again. Don't miss it. The will of God, when it begins to work in your life, where you see that it's good, acceptable, and perfect for you, you're into transformation. See how that is? See how that works? God calls that transformation. The word has been has been converted in your mind and life and heart into the will of God. And you are now surrendering your life to the will of God and you're bringing it out by your, the way you're choosing to live and you're discovering that it's good for you, it's acceptable, and it's perfect. Isn't that wonderful? That's called the direct will of God. Don't be conformed to the world. Be transformed by the word you're in one of those two. There's no third place. There's no third. You're either conformed to the world or transformed by the word. It's where's that? Romans 12, 2. You ought to walk away with here and that in your head. Paul's prayer, prayer for the spiritually advancing believers in Colossians 1, 9, and 10 is interesting. This is my prayer for you. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you be filled with the knowledge of his will. See, I came today, I bathed this thing in prayer. And what I prayed is that, look, that you be filled with the knowledge of his what? Will. in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that divine purpose, divine purpose, the word so that, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. See, transformation takes you into a walk that's worthy of the Lord. That's the directive will of God. And the directive will of God has got to have a geographical place. It's got to have a mental attitude in you that is compatible with the word of God. Right? right? 
If for no other reason, I wrote it on your paper because I thought you would forget. All right? So I wrote it down as a reminder. So this week when you study over my notes, you go like, oh, yeah. Now I say geographical, mental, operational. All three parts. And listen, listen to me. They all three have to line up under the directive will. And you're going to see in Paul's life, they're, they're not. And when they don't, you're in trouble. Hey, you're, you're in trouble. Point, point, number two, point number whatever three, Th that's the directive will. There is also the permissive will because man has volition. Permissive will is how God deals with the believer regarding choices, regarding the directive will. You know, he reveals to you what he wants from your life, and then you go like, well, I'm a free-thinking agent. I can do with what I want to do. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you can. Lots of luck. Lots of luck with that deal. The directive will was made clear to Paul to only go westward into the European theater by the Macedonian call. That is clear. Any other direction would be considered outside of God's directive will for the Gentile ministry of Paul. He didn't want him to go any other direction. He wanted him to go in deep into deep into the Gentile world. And he was about to be sent deep into the Gentile world. He was going to be sent to Italy. Out of Greece, he was going to be sent to Italy, into Spain, and then God would show him where he wanted to go once he got to Spain. But he, he wanted him deep into the Gentile world called the European theater. And so we have the permissive will of God. Because man has volition, God lays out his plan, and then man can do with it, you know, what man thinks he, what man ought to do with the will of God when it's laid out in front of him is do it. Right? I mean, Jesus Christ, God sent his only begotten son into the world to die on a cruel cross for your sins. He was buried, and on the third day raised from the dead to give you life everlasting. Why would you not believe that? You say, well, I don't know. Well, then, look, if you're not for sure about it, you ought to write these three verses down. You should write down 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, because it tells you what the gospel is, that Jesus came and died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. 1 Corinthians 15, oh, yeah, all good. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. The second thing you ought to write down is Romans 1, 16. Because Romans 1, 16 says the gospel, which we just explained, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. What do you have to do? Oh, believe. Oh, oh. Did Paul say you had to change the way you're living in order to be saved? No, he didn't. He said... That change won't come until you believe the gospel. Because when you believe the gospel, the Holy Spirit is sent into your life to help you overcome the problems of the flesh. The lust of the flesh. You can't beat the lust of the flesh in, in the flesh. Then Ephesians, write this down. If, you've been, if you wrote down 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, and you wrote down Romans 1, 16, and you should have if you didn't know them, then you ought to write down Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God. It's a gift. It's not on the basis of works. That would be wages. I mean, who works all week for a guy, and then he gives you something and says, that's a gift. <laughs> I mean, you want to reach out there and grab him, right? I don't think so. I don't think so. That's not a gift. That's, that's wages, baby. That's called wages. It's called work and wages. Listen, God don't save you that way. God don't save you that way. He saves you by grace, not works, right? Grace through faith, not works, right? It's a gift. And it's a gift that gives, keeps on giving. Well, the permissive will of God will, will, will be seen at work in the life of Paul. It is interesting that while in Corinth, still in Greece, but in Archaea, 
Well, in, in, listen, and, and Paul is supposed to go westward. He's supposed to go to Rome, and then he's supposed to go to Spain. That's, it's been clearly spelled out for him. When he gets to Corinth, to show you how God is so marvelous in ministry, he had a couple from Rome there. He had a Christian couple from Rome that had come out of Acts 2, the great Pentecostal work. He had a couple. Aquila and Priscilla. It's a wonderful story. And they were from Rome. In other words, he had a couple that were on fire for the Lord who had all kinds of contact, uh, contacts in Italy and especially in Rome where they were living. Is God not setting something up? If you know anything about God, that's how he works. Well, I find that to be interesting. He meets a couple from Rome and named Priscilla and Quilla. You can read about that in Acts 18, by the way. But Paul chooses, by volition, Paul chooses to go eastward to Syria. He takes this couple along with him. What it should have been, the other way around. This couple should have took him to Rome and introduced him. But he didn't. He chose not to. He chose not to. When he got to Sangria, when he got to Sangria, he took a Jewish vow and cut his hair. He did what? He took a Jewish vow and cut his hair. If there was ever a guy that was opposed to legalism and law, it was Paul, which almost ruined his life. The law was ruining his life when he met Christ on the road to Damascus. Well, isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Well, it's an interesting read. He cuts his hair and says he's going further east. See, he's headed east, right? Well, if you look at a map, he's going east. He's going east. Cuts his hair, takes a Jewish vow. You know what that's called in our language? Compromise. Compromise with legalism. And he, then, he, then he decides to go to further east. He says, he says, well, I'm going to Ephesus. Wait, where, where are you going, Paul? I'm going to Ephesus. Is that west? No, that's east. Mm. I'm not going with you. If I'd have been on Paul's team and I knew about where he was supposed to go, I'm not going east with him. I'm not going east with him. And nothing good is going to come from east. Not for Paul. He's supposed to go what? West. Isn't it interesting how we can see the directive will of God for other people, not for ourselves? <laughs> well, Paul should have died. Yeah, I know. So should you. So should I. In Ephesus, Paul revealed he intended to go. Oh, wait a minute, Paul. In Ephesus, he, Paul revealed that his intentions were to go to Jerusalem. That's as far east as Paul is willing to go. I mean, for him, that's the end of the Mecca. That's Mecca to him. Are you kidding me, Paul? Are you kidding me? Well, I don't care what his intentions were. I don't care what he thinks he's taking them people. He's going the wrong place. You don't need to take those people anything in Jerusalem. You need to take the gospel to the people in Rome. I gave you a couple that could set you up in Rome, introduce you to the people, and what do you do? Uh, right? So in Ephesus, Paul reveals, you can read about this in Acts 19, his intentions go to Jerusalem. But listen, this shows you the work of the Holy Spirit. How many times does he do this? The Holy Spirit interrupts him. 
The Holy Spirit of God interrupts him because he's the great convictor. That's his title, convictor. Comforter, convictor. He can give you this or give you that. <laughs> John 16. Watch this. Watch this. But he, listen, Paul says he must go back to Macedonia and Archaea. And so you see this funny thing go all of a sudden on the third missionary trip, he swings back. And here's what he said to himself. After I've been there, I must go to Rome. He's got that. Listen, the Holy Spirit went like, where are you going? You're going where? To Jerusalem? I don't think so. Who told you you could go to Jerusalem? I'm the third member of the Godhead, and I didn't get any word like that. Where are you supposed to go, Paul? Write this down. No, I, I'm saying what God said to Paul. <laughs> God bless you people. God bless you. You're such good students. Now, the Spirit says to Paul, write this down. To Paul. He says this to Paul. R O Ro? No, I'm not through. M Rome? No. E. Ah. Where where are you going? Rome. Da 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 da. See, Paul, that's that's the convicting work of the Holy Spirit that says to him. You're going to take me where? <laughs> You're going to drag me from the west to the east? You're going to drag me back into Jerusalem? For what? You're going to get us in such trouble. You, should, you can read about this in Acts 19 and Acts 20. See, I'm moving right through the book of Acts with you. And I, Paul is now working on his third missionary trip when this is all going on. He knew he must go west from Rome to Spain. Listen to me. Could, a lot of times you don't pay attention to stuff about where people are from and where they're going. All of Paul's ministry to the Gentiles has been westward. <laughs> When you study the life of Paul, you're going to see all of his ministry to the Gentiles was westward. Never went east. They went always west. All the way from Acts 13 until you get to the, the second missionary trip and you get to the Macedonian call. Acts 13 to Acts 16. And then he reassures to him, Paul, you're to go west. I'm pushing you into the European theater. And by the time we get to Acts 16, where Paul's ministry has been being pushed is the Gentile world. And now it's confirmed that God wants that to be absolutely established in the European theater. Again, so Paul is warned, Paul is warned by the Holy Spirit, right? That he ought to go westward. He is warned by the Holy Spirit to go westward. Now Paul has chosen to, to continue in Acts 20. Paul has continued to go eastward, even though he knows it's against the will of God. When he gets to back to Ephesus, the elders or the ministers gathered at a pastor's conference warned Paul about going to Jerusalem. That's his second warning. You always pay attention to those warnings that are alerting you. That's found in Acts 20. Again, Paul was warned against going eastward when he got to go eastward to Jerusalem, but that's now his goal. When he got in Caesarea by a recognized church prophet, recognized by all in the church, Agabus. And Agabus, you remember, took Paul's uh, belt and tied, tied uh, Paul up in it and said, the man who is wearing this is go go that goes any further east is going to be this. He's going to be bound and put in prison, all that. 
You remember that? Well, you should read it. It's pretty good reading. Paul went, oh, I'm not afraid of that. I, I, that's, I've been persecuted my entire life for preaching the gospel. What are I? No, Paul, it's not about that. It's about you're not supposed to go east. You're supposed to go west. Okay? I'm getting on a boat going the other way. I'm going back to Macedonia. I'll see you there or Rome. Once again, Paul is warned not to go east. And finally, the pastors go like, well, Paul couldn't be talked out of it. So they, they finally said, well, then the Lord's will be done. And boy, it will. The Lord's will be done. So point number four in closing. When you read the book of Acts, when you get to Acts 21.15, you pay attention to all the way to 28.31 because it all changes. The light of the gospel is now dark. And Paul has gone east. I don't care what God says. I'm going to do this. And from Acts 21, see, Agabus, listen, Agabus was Acts 21, 8 through 14. And Paul is not going to listen to the prophet sent by God. We enter into Acts 21, 15, and we go to the end of the book, and it's not good. In Acts 21, 15 through Acts 28, 31, we see the overruling will of God intervene in the life of Paul, just like it did in the life of Jonah. When Jonah was called to go, uh, east and went west. He was told to go to Nineveh. He went, no, nah, I don't think so. It didn't go good for him. It didn't go good for him. It didn't go good for him. In Acts 21, 15 through 28, 31, this will take us, will take Paul back to Rome like Jonah. He's going to Rome. He's going to Rome or else. Jonah is going to Nineveh or else. You don't want to be in that shape with God. Paul will get, Paul will get to Rome as the directive will of God on a prisoner ship. Won't be a passenger, be a prison ship. Much like Jonah who was swallowed by a sea monster and taken back to Joppa. Paul will arrive in Rome to fulfill his calling to go westward with his evangelism ministry, and he's writing about the future out of the book of Philippians. Now, here's my point in closing. Here's the point of my lesson to you and me. Stay faithful to the directive will of God in your life. It's always going to have three points to it. The geographical will, the mental will, and the operational will of God. And they all have to line up. You, you just set tight until they all three line up. They all three line up. You must stay faithful to the, great, to the directive will of God. You must stay faithful to the directive. What you know to be true from the word of God about your life, you need to stay true to it. Let's have a word of prayer. The man will take the offering. For those that are visiting, just sit tight. This is for our people. Uh, for my people, uh, our people, be sure that you fill out a, what, what form did we call that for? Uh, a directory form. We're about to put out our church directory, and we need to know who, who wants to be a part of this church and be regular with us. Uh, so be sure Rhonda will have those. This, she's the one with a hand in the air. She'll get them. See her, and she'll give you a form to fill out so that we can put the basic information in our church directory. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful today for these that come our way to study with us the directive will of God, and how important it is to our life, no matter who we are. Doesn't matter who we are. Our status never overrides the directive will of God. It comes from the head. It comes through from God through Christ to the body of believers. 
And nothing overrides the directive will of God, but God himself. So I pray today, Father, that we would be students of the word. And when things are revealed to us, we can identify it as the directive will of God because it will always be good, acceptable, and perfect. It will fit our life like a new pair of shoes that fit our feet wonderfully. It will always fit well in our life. The life of transformation. Take our offering today, Father. May we be wise stewards of it. We spend a little on ourselves and a lot on the mission work. We pray for Jackie and her team as they prepare to go to Kenya. That's an Acts 1 8 work to the uttermost parts of the earth. For Paul, it was to go west to the European theater. Then he would have found out that was not the end of the earth. And we might have had something wonderful set aside for him for America. Well, he finally did make that trip, and we're thankful for it. In Jesus' name, amen.